Hey, I have really good news. And it may not be readily obvious, but Jesus is still alive. The Lord is still risen. So I'm really glad to see all of you here uh, worshiping this morning, our online viewers, grateful for your presence too. You know, I know that from, from some people's perspective, and I get it, right, that I pretty much have the greatest job in the world because, like, I just have to work one day a week. <laughs> Occasionally there's a funeral or a wedding or something like that, but otherwise, you know. So, but it's not all cake and ice cream. There are some times in life and in being a pastor that things can get a little shaky, and probably one of the hardest times in, in my um, in my vocation was, it was like 2001. And um, I had led the church through some changes and not everybody loved those changes and some of them took exception in kind of some personal ways and, and some of them just left the church and, and, and all that. that was, it was kind of a hard time and, and, um, and it wasn't just me. Um, they took some of the stuff, you know, kind of got poured out on my family. I, one time, this is someone literally uh, an elder in the church got in my wife's face. Uh, at that point in time, that was her name. She was his wife, the pastor and his wife. Um, guy, like pointing in front of other people, like with his finger and her nose, because um, there was, the worship team had changed the word thou to you. Um, really important stuff like that. My 11-year-old daughter, then 11-year-old daughter, uh, remembers walking into a room where people are, were all laughing and, and kind of joking around, and, and she walked in and they got silent, and one of the people glared at her. She's 11. My um, then 7-year-old son had his friend tell him, my, my family's leaving the church because your daddy doesn't preach the word. It was a hard time. And it was a kind of that place in life like, man, I just want to get out of here. Have you had that experience in life? Have, have you ever just wanted to get away? Whatever it was that was going on, that it was, it was too much. That, that wherever it was going, you couldn't see any way that where it was going was going to be good. That literally or figuratively, you just wanted to check out. Maybe you did. Maybe you walked away and maybe it worked out. Maybe you have regrets. And, and I should say that in like that dark time of my life, I was not innocent. Like I did some things, handled situations the wrong way, said the wrong things, did the wrong things. Maybe you did check out. Maybe that's where you are today. Maybe you're listening to your, your message, this message, and, and you're just in a place where things have been really hard for too long and kind of feels like it's always going to be that way and, and you don't see a way out, you don't see things getting better, and you just want to run away. Last week in our um, Easter message, I talked about punctuating life with faith. And we walked with the, the Emmaus Road travelers and uh, they're, they had hoped that Jesus was the one, that he was the Messiah, that he was going to restore Israel, and, and their hopes had been dashed by the, by the crucifixion. And now they have all these questions because they're hearing that Jesus is alive, but, but they didn't see him. And, and so they're going back home, and, and along the way they meet Jesus on the road, and, and in the conversation with him, he, he reminds them of all the promises that God had made. And how it had to happen that those promises would be fulfilled. And they discovered that Jesus was alive. And that all those promises had a period. And the story wasn't over until those promises were fulfilled. And they declared the Lord is risen. I'm going to take a couple, few weeks to look at some people in the story who have punctuated their life with faith. Beginning with um, David. From Psalm chapter 11. Uh, I, I'm going to preach the word to you this morning, straight out of what the psalmist says. And in the psalm, David is, he's on the ropes. He, he's in that place in life where things are really, really hard. And somebody comes to him and says to David, flee like a bird to your mountain. For look, the wicked bend their bows. They set their arrows against the strings to shoot from the shadows at the upright in heart. David, the enemy is on your doorstep 
and there is a target on your back. You need to get out of Dodge. You need to run. You need to go. They're shooting from the shadows at the upright and heart. You ever feel that way? Like, like you're getting taking hits and you don't even know where they're coming from. And somebody's telling him, David, make a run for it. Get out of here. Go. When the foundations are being destroyed, what can the righteous do? When the world is falling apart, what can one person trying to do the right thing? What can one person do? Flee like a bird to your mountain. David's question. Trouble is coming hard. And it's coming fast. What am I going to do? David's response follows in the psalm. The Lord is in his holy temple. The Lord is on his heavenly throne. He observes everyone on earth. His eyes examine them. The Lord examines the righteous, but the wicked, those who love violence, he hates with a passion. On the wicked, he will rain fiery coals and burning sulfur. A scorching wind will be their lot. For the Lord is righteous. He loves justice. The upright will see his face. David rehearses what he knows. He declares his periods. These are the truths. The Lord reigns. The Lord is in his holy temple. The Lord is on his heavenly throne. The Lord is king. The Lord is sovereign. The Lord is reigning over creation. He's on the throne. He's paying attention. He observes what's happening on the earth. His eyes examine it. He sees what's going on. He's not oblivious to what David's going through, the struggles, the challenges that you're facing. He's not like, oh, wow, I never saw that coming. Or, he, he's, like, he's not disengaged. He's not disconnected. He's not ignoring. He sees what's going on. He's paying attention. And he's not indifferent to it either. Right? He sees it, and it matters to him. The ex- Lord examines the righteous, but the wicked... The violence he hates with a passion. The Lord reigns, he sees, he knows, and he cares. David's first period the Lord is in charge, the Lord is ruling, the Lord is reigning. Period. And his second period. The Lord is righteous. The the Lord is right. The Lord does the right thing. In his righteousness, he loves justice. Justice is the expression of rightness. Righteousness is like, if you are righteous, then you do justice. If it isn't right, it isn't just. And his righteousness demands justice wherever it's absent. Wherever there isn't justice, righteousness says justice needs to be brought into this place. And so on the wicked, he will rain fiery coals and burning sulfur. A scorching wind will be their lot. A Good Friday message said God's love doesn't eradicate sin. It, it doesn't, because God loves us, I think a lot of us have this, and like, well, God is love, so certainly he wouldn't, you know, he wouldn't judge us. He, he loves us. He forgives us. But, but love doesn't eradicate sin. It doesn't sweep it under the rug. It doesn't make it go away. Love motivates God to act on our behalf. If righteousness doesn't necessitate justice, the cross wasn't necessary. Jesus did not need to die if God was just love. 
Jesus' death was necessitated because God is love and God is righteous and his righteousness demands justice. And his justice, <clears throat> excuse me, his justice, David says, it will prevail. It, it, it will be executed. It will be carried out. It will happen. He's, he's on the throne. He reigns. His rule is sovereign over all of creation. He's righteousness. What the king wants, the king gets. Who the king is, the king will impart. His justice will, will prevail. So the wicked will suffer the consequences of their injustice, of their unrighteousness, of their violence. And the righteous will see his face. So David's question, trouble's coming hard. What am I going to do? David's period, the Lord is sovereign, the Lord reigns, he's sitting on his throne, and the Lord is righteous. Period. These things are true. These things, this story isn't over because of who God is until these things are fulfilled. Until everyone knows and everyone sees and is fully established that God is sovereign on his throne and that he is righteous. This story does not end. David is declaring his conviction, his confidence, his belief that God is sovereign and God is righteous and he's applying it to his situation and he comes to this exclamation. His, his counselor, his advisor is saying, dude, you're in trouble. Get out of here. Run. And David says, how can you say to me, flee like a bird when God is sovereign and God is righteous? In the Lord, I take refuge. Exclamation point. In the Lord, I take refuge because he is sovereign, because he is reigning, because he is righteous. All this is going to be played out. My refuge, my security, my safety, my place, my position is in God's refuge. From the exit from the garden, all the way back in Genesis 1. We've been, we, humanity, have been exiles. Right? We, we're not at home. We're not in the place that we were made to live. We were created for a garden of beauty and love and joy and peace and intimacy and adventure and all the wonders that God created in all the world. We were made for a different place than the world that we live in. You go to Hebrews chapter 11, we looked at this last week too, and you have all the saints, all the people that have lived in, in relationship with God throughout history, Abraham and Moses and David and, and on down the line. And, and the story says that all these people were still living by faith when they died. They, they hadn't seen what they had been promised yet. The promise hadn't been fulfilled. They were living, believing that it was still coming because God said it was so. They did not receive the things promised. They only saw them and welcomed them from a distance, admitting that they were foreigners and strangers on earth. This is not our home. From, from the time of the exit from the garden, we have been exiles. And and. We go to great lengths. We, again, humanity, humankind, and I don't, this doesn't matter what you believe or who you believe, right? As human beings, we go to great lengths to recreate Eden. Now, we may not know that that's what we're doing, but that's what we're doing. We go to incredible lengths to try and recreate Eden, to try and bring heaven back to earth, to try and bring our lives back to that place of fullness and significance and abundance and peace and security and confidence and love. Looking for something to fulfill our longings that cannot be satisfied for anything that we've experienced in our lives so far. And it's always the next thing because we already know that the last thing didn't work. 
So, right, early on, it's going to be when I get to this stage of life, when I have this, when I get there, when I do that, then I will live a life, then I will have life, then I will have fullness. Always the next thing, always looking down the road. So today I'm supporting my Purdue alumni gear. Um, For about 45 years, I had been entertaining the notion that when Purdue basketball wins the national championship, that I will have joy, that I will have lasting joy, that I will have enduring joy. 45 years. Tomorrow night, Purdue will play in the national championship game. In the 45 years, this is the first time that it actually could happen. And and so tomorrow night, if Purdue wins... God will finally have the opportunity to teach me that this will not bring lasting joy to me. And I'm just hoping he'll do that for me. So would you join me as your friend and pastor in praying that Purdue can win so I can once and for all know that that will not bring the lasting joy that I desire. And you might think, well, what about UConn? You know, they need the same. No, they got the lesson last year. And they're back for more. We're always looking for something. And we can find some really crazy stuff to bring back heaven to earth, to arrange for life. And Jesus announced the return of Eden. He he said it's coming. He called it heaven on earth. I have come to restore the kingdom of heaven to declare it's coming. Pray for it. Seek it. In all of its righteousness, I have come to restore all things. And this refuge that David trusted God for, his righteousness and his rule, was fulfilled in Christ So the fiery coals and burning sulfur raining down, the scorching wind blowing, they do fall. They fall on the earth because God is righteous and his righteousness demands justice. And they fall on Jesus so that everyone who takes refuge in him sees the face of God because they are clothed, covered, protected in his righteousness. We take refuge in him. We see his face. And all the wonders of heaven and earth are wired to righteousness and justice for all. Not just Duke or Kentucky or Yukon, but for all. And God's righteousness and justice you pray for and we seek his kingdom is not just about getting our own, our king. It's about lifting others up and bringing peace and life and love and joy to all of creation. And so Peter talks about living in God's shelter, right? If we're in this place of being in his refuge and we're under his reign and his rule and walking and living in his righteousness, dear friends, he says, I urge you as foreigners and exiles, you're not at home, to abstain from sinful desires, the pursuit of your own version of heaven on earth, which wage wars against your soul, because they never deliver. Live such good lives among pagans that though they accuse you of doing wrong, they may see your good deeds and glorify God on the day he visits us. So that they may know that there's a place where they are safe, where there is a refuge, where there is security. This is an incredible question that David's 
advisor asks, when the foundations are being destroyed, what can the righteous do? Elect the right president? Get a better job? Run away to the mountains? Hide out in your home? Turn on the TV? When the foundations are being destroyed, what can the righteous do? Oswald Chambers wrote a devotional. Actually, he wrote a bunch of stuff, and um, one of his family members put together, edited his material, and put it together in a book called My Utmost for His Highest. It's a great devotional resource. He says, when the foundations are being destroyed, the righteous can trust God. Trust God's sovereign reign over creation. Trust God's righteousness and justice will prevail. And do the next thing. And do the next thing. Jim Elliott was a missionary to the Wa'arani. Um, it's an indigenous people group in the Amazon jungle in Ecuador. And he went there to translate the scriptures into their language so that they could hear and know the truth of God's life and love for them. On January 8th of 1956, he and four of his companions were killed by ten warriors from the Wa'arani people group. His wife was there on the mission field with him. They had a child. And after her husband was killed, she had a decision to make. Flee to safety, go back home with her, with her daughter to a place of safety and security again. And can you imagine if you were her parent or her friend, how many people were telling her, hey, her name is Elizabeth. Elizabeth, flee to the mountains. Run for your life. They took your husband. They took his friends. They're coming for you next. And she decided to stay. And she, this is a quote from Elizabeth Elliot. She says, I was faced with many confusions and uncertainties. I had good, a good many new roles. Besides that of being a single parent and a widow, I was alone on a jungle station that Jim and I had manned together. I had to learn to do all kinds of things which I was not trained or prepared in any way to do. It was a great help to me simply to do the next thing. To declare the periods, the promises. God is on his holy throne. God is reigning over all of creation. God is righteous. God is just, and his justice will prevail. And Elizabeth Elliot's presence would lead to the gospel being proclaimed to that community to the point where she would one day live among the very men who killed her husband for two years. God's reign, God's righteousness, his justice will prevail. Trust that your story, wherever you're at and whatever it is right now and however much you want to flee for the mountains, take refuge in God. Because the story isn't over until these things prove true. Trust God and do the next thing. Lord, thank you for David's faithfulness in the face of overwhelming obstacles.
maybe even in his situation, certain death if he didn't run away. And for Elizabeth Elliot, in the same way, who stood in a place where you had called her and her family to go and believed in you and your promise and your presence in spite of everything that was going on, and you used her faithfulness to bring redemption to a people. And I pray for everyone who's listening to this message today, where they are in their story, and the challenges and the struggles and the frustrations and the disappointments and the doubts that they're facing. They could hear in their ears, believe in their hearts that you are ruling from your holy throne that you are righteous and that justice will prevail and that there is refuge, safety, security in you and that these periods will become exclamation points. We don't know how, we don't know when, But if you're on the throne and you are righteous, your kingdom will come and your will will be done on earth as it is in heaven. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen.